Hello, everybody. Hello. And welcome to Temple Judah. Hello. I'll give a brief introduction to uh, Michael, and then we'll get the uh, show on the road, as they say. Uh, somewhere I heard the phrase, if you build it, they will come. It actually says, if you build it, he will come. Referring to the Father. So, uh, welcome to uh, 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 Temple Judah. Uh, like I said, Michael Luke Thrams. I have known for a couple of decades. Uh, so, he is from Iowa, from a farm in uh, northern Iowa. Uh, he became a, an historian, I trained in Berlin, where he spends, roughly speaking, half the year. Is that about right? And the other half in Iowa. I, I dare say that, at least in the state of Iowa, I know of no one who has brought history to more people than Michael. And I would estimate hundreds of thousands of people, I am not exaggerating, have learned history from Michael. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe it's true. He, he has gone to the people, so as to say, driven the state multiple times. Is that correct? So you saw the Basium, where you went through the bus? That's us. So, and his first book, I believe it was your first book, was about this topic. The topic of the Scattergood School in West Branch and how it uh, housed a couple of hundred, mainly Jews, and other refugees from, from Nazi Germany in the state of Iowa. The school is still in existence, by the way. And there are alumni who, <coughs> uh, probably a few left anyway, right? Not many. So, without further ado then, uh, let us hear from Michael. I'm going to sit over here because he has some interesting slides related to this topic. And uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Steve. A good guest speaker, or at least a courteous one, thanks the host, good rabbi and, and congregation. But Steve gets an extra special thank you. We are now collaborating. Last Saturday, we were in a little town with 20 people. Now, it might have been 200, but we were in a little town talking about German anti-German hysteria in World War I. Then he showed uh, camp money from the internment camps of World War I. Then we got in the car, ran like hell to Eldora, and there we slung down a, a fast food lunch and spoke about German POWs who'd been at Camp Eldora. They were in Tama, Toledo, and he spoke about POW camp monies. On um, Sunday, I should mention that Steve and I will be in Grinnell at the public library. It's called the Drake Public Library in Grinnell. And Steve will be going and talking about concentration camp monies. So we collaborate now. And I don't know if, if Steve will admit this in public, but he's also on our board of directors, the Traces Board of Directors. But our relationship began through his wife, who I met at the History Center, Barbara, she said, you've got to meet my husband. And she was right. And since then, it's been a long love affair with speaking together. He's advised me on books. I've read his books. So I'm glad that Steve is organizing this today with others. <clears throat> the topic that I want to talk about tonight basically is Midwesterners' response to the Holocaust with a case study of Scattergood Hostel. But I want to relativize it to our current era. I guess many people would agree we live in a time of a lot of contentiousness. People have strong opinions. Many times people with strong opinions aren't interested in talking to the other side or there's great disagreements. And a lot of it has to do with politics of identity, um, charges of political correctness, which sometimes I've been a victim of. Um, so tonight, I weighed into the topic with some trepida trepidation it's a topic I feel I must talk about in the wider context, but it's not easy. And I think one of the easiest ways to approach an awkward topic is to first self-denigrate, so you know that I'm not only wagging fingers at other people, but saying I also have been blind or stupid. In the early 90s, I was living in Berlin. In Berlin, I had just left Czechoslovakia and moved to Berlin to be with my partner, who was German. Um, and I'll tell you the story later if we have time to the questions and answers, but I had to be a student to stay for visa purposes, and it just happened that I was a student. I took up the cause of the Scattergood hostel legacy because I really thought it was important, but I was in my early 30s, and it was the early 90s. So if you go back 25 years in time, less time before that, the world had been talking about multiculturalism, 
political correctness in a way, now it's, it's different, but multiculturalism. And so I began to approach the Scattergood Hustle story with a certain ax to grind to talk about multiculturalism. How did these Quaker, and, and there were some other people who weren't Quaker, but how did these mostly Quaker hosts, as they called themselves, welcome these mostly Jewish, but there were others, um, refugees? And at first I came up, I was only 30, so I can excuse myself saying I was young and stupid, but I came up with this idea of those, you could have said the bad Quakers, but let's say the blind Quakers violated the refugees' cultures of origin. So I was going to write in my thesis, because you have to have an argument to write a thesis, and I was, promo I was getting promoted at the Humboldt University as a doctoral student. I was going to document how the Quakers failed to honor the cultures that these people brought with them. Problem was, it was all wrong. <laughs> so when I got two scholarships from the city of Berlin, um, it's called the Luftbrücke Dankstiftung, which translates the Airlift Gratitude Foundation, former West Berlin, which in my day had just fused with East Berlin. And so it was basically a yeah, West German style politic and um, funding and everything. But I got two grants to come to Chicago, Rockford, Illinois, Des Moines, Iowa City, another trip to Pennsylvania, to Boston, to New Haven, home of Yale. And I interviewed 40 former refugees and staff who'd been at Scattergood. I arrived with my naive ideological agenda, and I very quickly realized that it was bunk. That the refugees said, kids, you don't get it. It was war by that point. We didn't want to go to the grocery stores and order the food at the grocery store with a German accent. Okay, so it was very difficult and dangerous for these people to come to America, even as victims of the Nazis, and go into a shop during war with a German accent. They said, we wanted to learn English. We wanted to lose our accents. We wanted to integrate. It was the only way that we thought we could survive. Of course, I had to go back to Berlin. Wolfgang met me in the door and say, how'd it go? And I said, it was disastrous. Well, they didn't help you? He said, no, they helped too much. So there went my first thesis topic. That's OK. I came up with a better one. Um, so I, I point that out as to say that I, too, have been the overzealous subscriber of political correctness, being an academic in the early 90s, especially in Europe, you want to find some edge to argue for in your thesis, but mine was naive and stupid. Um, you know, I'm working into difficult topics here. I, when, I, when I crucify myself and say I was a, an idiot, a footnote I want to uh, insert here, though, is when I went to the Library of Congress in Washington to look for tracks about multiculturalism while I was still doing that. Do you know that most of the early tracks about multiculturalism come from Cedar Falls, from the University of Northern Iowa, from Iowa City? Um, a lot of the multicultural stuff began here in the late 60s, early 70s. Many of you who are older will remember that film, Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes, the little school in Riceville, Iowa. That's my cousin, Jane Elliott. So it's gotta be genetic, I guess. And it was indeed in Iowa which we thought was Lily White, and I'll come back to that later probably, we thought that we didn't have lots of racism and friction between minorities. Um, we were the pushers. Almost all the copyrights of these early tracks and studies are from Iowa, the late 60s, early 70s, multiculturalism, including Jane Jennison, her maiden name, Elliot, that's Jennison, my grandfather's mother's name. Um, this was all being driven from the American heartland, and that's relevant. I just wonder if I should give you my other anecdote, whether it's relevant. Um, <clears throat> other cultures are around us. Sometimes we perceive them, sometimes we don't. And we're all called to address each other openly and fairly. But often when you have cultures like the United States or Northern Ireland or the Middle East, Middle Eastern countries, you have different cultures clashing together. It's often difficult to see someone's differentness and to be able to acknowledge it or celebrate it. I'm thinking of when I was a little boy in northern Iowa. I grew up on a farm between Mason City and Clear Lake. Um, it was the late 60s, 70s. There had been riots in Detroit, I think Baltimore, Chicago, etc. And I was a kid, but I was old enough, moxie enough to realize we have a racial problem. And I had learned from the people around me, school teachers or Sunday school teachers or someone, that most of the problem were those southern whites, but we in the north, we weren't racist and 
And I remember there, was a, there were two girls, the um, sisters at the end of the, the corner of our section. They'd gone to California for a while and, and moved back. And in first grade, we were in the school bus, and Debbie, talk, she used the N-word, talking about African Americans. And I, from my enlightened parents' household, said, Debbie, those are Negroes. Of course, even today, that word is no longer in our parlance. So we, uh, we try, in our imperfection, to be fair and open and correct and to address people as they want to be addressed. And that's one of the things that comes up at Scattergood if one tells the wider story, which is what I want to do tonight. So I'm going to tell you two different stories. One, and they're both true. I'm going to tell you a rousing Oprah Winfrey type of story. We're all going to get up and want to hug each other. And the other story is about Scattergood. It's also true, but it's more like, what's, the, what's that show with... Um, um, Whoopi Goldberg and the rest, what's it called? The View. The view. So one of the stories we're going to see is, is Oprah Winfrey and love and hugging. The next one's going to be The View, cantankerous and in your face. Let's start with the happy, picture, the happy story. This is from Iowa Public Television, the late 90s. And it's all true, but it's got a certain perspective. Just said we're going to see two stories. <clears throat> this was made in the late... 90, I think about 98 or so. Um, what is really good is it commemorates the great achievement that was Scattergood. Um, these were young Iowa students. Many of them were Quakers, not all. There were a few Presbyterians, a few Unitarians, and others. And it was Quaker farmers. And for the first time in 50 years or so, the two branches of Iowa Quakerdom came together, the so-called program Quakers, who were more, they became more like Baptists and Methodists with prayers and sermons and a little bit of silence, and the conservatives who owned Scattergood, and they had conserved the early Quaker practices of meeting in silence and to sit and to go inside, which is sort of Quakers that I'm still part of. Those two branches came together. The program Quakers went home and got old dishes and towels and bedding and desk, brought them to what had been the Quaker boarding school run by the conservatives, and the conservatives gave the use of the place to American Friends Service Committee just like you also have large Jewish agencies on the East Coast or abroad, the American Friends Service Committee later, after World War II, got a Nobel Peace Prize for its war relief efforts. Um, the FSC was overseeing this, and this is part of the problem. When we talk about anti-Semitism in a few minutes after the film, this is part of the problem, is you had a clash of cultures, these Iowa farmers who, I think it's fairly accurate to say, saw this need and brought all these refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe meaning not just Germany or Austria, but Hungary, Poland, occupied France, Belgium. There were some Russian Jews in there, Polish Jews. So these were these farmers being very Iowa-esque and having come from a farm, I can say that, and it's not a um, slur. These people are in need, bring them in. Have a potluck, um, sell some apple pies to raise money to you know, feed them. Whereas the AFSC Quakers, these urban Philadelphia Quakers, had a different worldview and a different agenda, didn't they? So this was sort of a clash. You had Ma and Pa Quaker out on the prairie doing apple pie baking and giving English lessons, and you had the um, Quakers on the East Coast also wanting to maintain their organization. There were politics involved, much more than for the local Quakers. Um, if our good rabbi thinks it's going to be a while, I guess... Um, to use the time profitably, I've got a couple of kind of peripheral questions that I could ask now, if that's okay. It wouldn't be not okay. I just wonder if it'll feed where I want to go, but let's try. What's your okay, question? Well, um, I want to use two instances in, um, in recent history. Um, first of all, the Postville experience. And that, again, that's Iowa and uh, uh, Rabashkin and so yep. forth. And I know that there's a book out which claims that there was a great deal of friction between the two. Well, I've heard from other people, other Jews, as a matter of fact, that that is clearly not the case. And I'd like to hear your comments. Question number two, my perception of Cedar Rapids, and I talked to my, some of my relatives in New York, they can hardly believe it, that because the Muslim community is so well established in Cedar Rapids, there's a kind of ecumenical um, esprit de corps, uh, um, I, I mean, I, I, that, that is <coughs> rare and wonderful. So these are two examples of, I think, 
the postal stories of being wrong, two examples of very, very good interaction between ethnic groups. And I want to know what you think. I cannot speak about post when I don't want to because I don't know enough about it. I just know peripheral things. But again, it's a good case study. Why is it that religious people clash when most people are looking for the way home to a spiritual home? And ironically, it's exactly religious groups that often clash. Look at the Protestants in this country, of which I come out of tradition, how many uh, divisions are there among Protestants, and they divided the Southern Baptists, the Northern Baptists. I mean, they're all supposedly trying to propagate love for the Christian worldview, and yet you get all this fighting. But I don't want to talk about post as such, but the second question I will, uh, I think one of the oldest mosques in the country is, was built here. What, what I will say is that the project at Scattergood, on one hand, was not just interdenominational, in some ways it was almost non-denominational. I don't think most of the Quakers on the ground really cared. And as I said, some of the uh, staff were Presbyterians or Unitarians or whatever. Um, that's the good news. How close are you to? And the rest I'll come back to, I promise, but not Postville. So let's try to get this going. During World War II, a Quaker boarding school near West Branch, Iowa, was transformed into a safe haven for refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe. In 1998, Living in Iowa told the story of that temporary hostel known as Scattergood. When we became aware of a recent reunion of people who participated in that humanitarian effort, we felt it was worthwhile to put the spotlight back on this brave chapter of Iowa history. For the 1939 residents of West Branch, Iowa, this gravel lane served as the main route into town. But to European refugees trying to escape Hitler's tyranny, the dusty Iowa road was a path to safety. Basically, we're talking about Schindler's List on the prairie. The only difference is, is that everyone in the world knows about Oskar Schindler and the 1,100 Jews he saved in Middle Europe. Almost no one knows about the 185 refugees that Iowa Quaker farmers and college kids saved. From 1939 to 1943, nearly 200 refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe found a safe haven at Scattergood Hostel, a makeshift commune on the site of what had been a Quaker boarding school. Here, outside the small town of West Branch, Iowa Quakers hosted Jews as well as Hitler's political dissidents, offering them food, shelter, and a glimmer of light in the midst of Nazi darkness. Admittedly, 185 is a drop well, it's not even a drop in the bucket compared to six million people who perished at Auschwitz and Treblinka and all the other death camps. But 185 souls saved was more than what was being saved down the road. I mean, this story is a story, a remarkable story, of Iowa Quaker farmers and college students who had no connection with these people, had no obligation, and in many cases couldn't even correctly pronounce their names, but brought them over from Berlin and Prague and Vienna and Budapest and saved their lives. If the Quakers had not saved them, they would have all been killed at Auschwitz and gone up the chimney as ashes. But because of the bravery of some people, their lives were saved. People pretty much like you, actually. For author Michael Lewitt Trams, the Scattergood story is an example of goodness during a time of hatred, a rarity in world history he feels compelled to share with everyone he can, from Quaker congregations to these Des Moines High School students. If you were a refugee, where would you go? Where would you find help? Who would help you? Most people don't do anything in most uh, areas of their lives to actively, ongoingly help someone else. You know, life as hard as it is, we don't want to be responsible or feel responsible for somebody else, so we turn the other way. Well, during the Third Reich, most people ignored these peoples who were trying to scurry out of harm's way. What's amazing is that the Iowa Quakers didn't like with getting to know a person, the more that you get to know about Scattergood Hostel, the more you realize this is exciting, this is life changing. If I involve myself in this, if I invest my, my heart, not just my head, but my heart in this story, it will change me. For Michael, pictures of Scattergood offer a glimpse into just how unique the hostel really was. In fact, you'd swear these to be snapshots of a peaceful family farm rather than images of a wartime refugee camp. Unlike most service agencies, which offered limited assistance during business hours only, 
Scattergood operated as a full-time commune, with each refugee staying an average of four months. Here, Quakers and Jews not only shared field work and daily chores, but also the tremendous burden of war's impact. Some of the people had been through great trauma. Some had known hunger, had been beaten. Some had been in Dachau. None of these 49 volunteers had had any training. They didn't know what post-traumatic syndrome was. They hadn't been instructed in psychology or in counseling, and yet they came and gave what they had the most of, which was vitality and enthusiasm, idealism and love. On a practical level, that love meant, I'm going to listen to your story even when I'm tired and I have five other things distracting me. Love means that when you're hurting, I'm strong enough to ask you what you're hurting about and will re really listen to the answer. There's something that all of us could do to help out the life of someone. While Quaker representatives in Europe helped refugees secure immediate needs like visas and passage money, Iowa Quakers, with their modest resources, channeled efforts into long-reaching acts of human kindness, opening their homes to the war-torn Europeans whose harrowing escapes had led them to the United States. In addition to therapeutic social activities, the Scattergood staff provided health care, language classes, and job training hoping to give refugees, or guests as they were called, a foundation on which to rebuild their lives. They wanted these tattered and tired people to feel that they were worthy of respect. Even if they learned fabulous English and they could work wonders with a hammer and saw, if the people had not found their own centers, if they had not rediscovered themselves while well, scattered good, all the practical training in the world would not have made a big difference. When you're under that much attack, under that much stress, I think your soul goes on vacation. You have to vacate your life, your biography, your body, just to survive. At Scattergood Hostel, uh, people's souls, people's spirits could rejoin their bodies, the biographies. People could rest. The Quakers intended this a place to be where people could regather themselves, and indeed that's what happened. Of the 23 children who passed through Scattergood, all but three became either teachers, psychologists, or social workers, each demonstrating a desire to share the goodness found on the Iowa prairie. For the young guests, Scattergood was an introduction to Midwestern treats, like marshmallows and pony rides. But for 15-year-old Gunter Krauthammer, it was also a long-awaited return to serenity. After Hitler came to power, it was, a, it was a frightening situation, really. I knew I wasn't going to, I couldn't live in Germany. Uh, but you don't know where you're going to end up. So you, you have this, uh, this uncertainty, because you don't know where you're going to go to school, you don't know where you're going to be when you grow up, uh, you don't know what's going to happen, and everything is always temporary. You don't know what to expect, and, and you don't make any plans, because uh, there's no point in making plans, because it's, everything is too unpredictable. So Scattergood made a huge impression on me, a very deep impression, and in retrospect, it sort of looms as a safe haven. I guess really the first one in my own life that I had. In May of 1998, after an absence of nearly 50 years, George returned to the grounds of Scattergood Hostel, which has turned back into a Quaker boarding school. Scattergood somehow has meant a great deal to me, and I can't put it into words, you know. but. It must have, because I, I've, I've constantly thought about it, and wherever I go, whatever it was, it was just a very unique uh, and powerful experience for me. It changed my life. In the beginning, Scattergood was created to counter the tragedies of racism, but ironically, it was racism itself that brought the hostel to a close. In later years, as the war in Europe escalated, it became nearly impossible for European refugees to find safe passage to Scattergood. The Iowa Quakers then turned their attention to Japanese Americans who had been forced into relocation camps. However, the West Branch residents, who had once embraced European refugees, now vehemently refused to accept Japanese Americans into their town. Unable to fight the town's protests, the Quakers were forced to close the hostel bringing Scattergood's four-year path of light to a dark end.
On November 9, 2003, Living in Iowa attended a special reunion of a dozen people with scattergood ties, including former staff and members of refugee families. The event, which was held in Waukee, Iowa, brought together people who hadn't been back to Iowa for nearly 60 years. The occasion was the opening of a traveling exhibit which recreates the atmosphere of the old refuge and displays some of the hundreds of photographs and stories about those times. To find out more about the exhibit and when it will travel to your part of the state, link to the Traces website through our Living in Iowa website. What the good rabbi could do is take one of your um, um, youth groups to Tipton. That exhibit is now permanently in Tipton, the county seat of Cedar County, which is the county where Scattergood is still today. So if you're interested, that exhibit, almost literally intact as you saw it, is visible, visible there, and you could take students, or Steve could take his students. <clears throat> I guess we could have the lights on again. And I'm, thank you. No, it's not going to come up again. Why won't it go? Um, I'll talk until you wrestle it to the ground and beat it. Um, so I, I had said earlier in my notes that context is key, and I want to beat that drum one more time. Um, why did I learn at home that it wasn't okay to use the N-word that even in the late 60s one should say Negroes? Because of my mother, who in the 40s and 50s would actually go to the Martins' house, they had eight kids or something, and the doctor was Grandma Trams' foot doctor, his wife was one of the first African-American nurses in Northern Iowa, and mom would go and play piano with Cynthia, who later lived in Cedar Rapids and actually died in an epileptic seizure, and her brother Anthony. I think my mom would never admit it, but I think she had a crush on Tony. At any rate, she would go as a teenager and play music and visit the Martins in their home, which was not a given for young white girls in Iowa in the 40s and 50s, I would say. And my grandparents, the Tramses, grandma had been born in Central City and grew up in Mount Vernon across from the college, um, they would go to Hispanic families' homes for dinner in the 40s. This was atypical. My father's people, on the other hand, great-grandfather, George Michael Lewick, for whom I was named, was in the Iowa KKK. So, yeah, everyone, it's okay, we'll deal with it. I'm here, we'll, we'll breathe deeply, and we'll, we'll walk through this. At any rate, I'm saying context is key because what happened to the refugees here has something to do with context. Both what the Philadelphia Quakers are trying to do with their little memos, which I'll tell you about in a moment, and with the Iowa Quaker farmers, what they were attempting to do. But before I do that, I don't know if we have a web, we don't have. It's been cursed. I will continue until he finds this. Actually, I, I'd rather do this in the, in the size really of the moment. Would. They would just distract. Um, where I was going with the website, if we ever get to traces.org, you can look at it at home, but you won't know where to go, is the context I want to paint for you is what sort of America or Midwest were these refugees coming to in the 19, early, uh, late 30s, early 40s. It was, in many ways, an anti-Semitic country. I would have pulled up for you on our website an article from Minnesota, I think the early 90s or late 90s, that Minneapolis was once called the anti-Semitic capital of the United States. Not St. Paul, interestingly enough, where I still have my condo, on the right side of the river. Um, St. Paul had a different ethnic mix, but for whatever reason, the Scandahuvians in Minneapolis, there was really a problem. That Jews were sort of pushed off to the northwest quarter of the city in Minneapolis. Jews had, there were quotas, um, if at all, in country clubs, things like that. You know the whole routine. And there were articles in the 90s about Minneapolis that supposedly, in this era, it was one of the anti-Semitic capitals of the country. It could have been Baltimore, it could have been Seattle, I don't know, but it happened to be in the Midwest, and it's a case study. There were other Midwestern contexts for anti-Semitism, of which you know probably much far better than I. Henry Ford, what's interesting with Henry Ford, the automobile maker who changed America forever with automobilizing the country, is that I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that African-American workers got the same pay as white workers, which was relatively progressive for the period, and yet he had his horrible um, uh, newspaper, the Dearborn, whatever it was called, rapidly anti-Semitic all the time, 24-7. Father Coughlin, who was actually Canadian, but because he was active in Detroit, he's on our website. The Traces Center for History and Culture, which exists since 2001, and this German sister, which exists since 2011, the Traces uh, pro project is always Midwest-based. We were all about, initially, 
connections between the Midwest and Germany later annexed Austria in 1933 to 48. Our mission has now spread because most of the people are gone. Thank you. That, that we would have looked at. Um, and now we have two projects, one there and one here, Traces or Spuren in German. If you go to our website, traces.org, you can learn about it in English. You can brush up your German. If you keep going, excuse me, you get down to a current events, our tour schedule. There are films there. I'm actually on a speaking tour. And through the end of July, I'll be all around here with different topics, one of which will be this repeating, but other topics which we can talk about. But if you click on to the website, this will take you here where we have everything Midwest all the time. Um, for example, if I, this isn't touch screen, is it? OK. Um, next time, Rabbi, I want this to be. All right. So if you look, for example, at, whoops, uh, sorry. If you look at admirers of Nazism, I was just talking about <clears throat> Henry Ford getting um, a special iron cross from the Nazi regime, all right, for his entrepreneurism. Charles Lindbergh, the Minnesotan, born in Detroit, I think, but grew up in Minnesota. This is in Des Moines, I think, with his America First speech that reinforced American isolationism, the American Bund. Our own lesser known pro-Nazis, Frederick Kaltenbach, who grew up between Waterloo and Dubuque and later had a career in Dubuque. Um, he later became the Tokyo, Tokyo Rose for the German regime. Okay, so he did for the Nazis what Tokyo Rose did for the, uh, the Japanese. Whoops, I keep, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, the Staatsanzeiger North Dakota. His father, uh, Kaufman, who I find a particularly disagreeable character, that's why I was before we got the computer back up. He was a Canadian who came, made a huge career um, in, based in Detroit, nationwide in the 20s and 30s, and it was also rapidly anti-Semitic. In my notes, just a few more examples. Um, again, you folks know this much better than I, don't you? Um, as Ambassador Dodd, actually that one I do want to show you. So we have immigrants and exiles. For example, we have the Von Trapps, who were at Cornell College. There's a prince. These are all uh, Ernst Krenick, who I don't think was Jewish, but he was a uh, jazz opera writer in Vienna. He fled and got a job teaching at Hamlin College in St. Paul, Minnesota. But we get down here to the Von Trapps, who were at, wait for it, with the Trapmobile, Cornell College. And after they sang, people said, you should go and sing for the refugees of Scattergood. So they did, of course. The next day, they got in the Trapmobile, and they went to Scattergood Hostel. And they sang in their Drindel and their Lederhosen. Um, so there are all these examples, but the one I was trying to get to, I'm sorry? I don't know. Uh, during the Q&A, tell me what you're thinking. Um, you can go through this at home, but I was actually trying to get to Midwest diplomats. You know George F. Kennan, the post-war contain Soviet containment architect. He was in Nazi Germany when Pearl Harbor was bombed and he was interned with the others. Before that, he'd been in Prague when the Germans annexed the Sudetenland. But it's the ambassador, Ambassador Dodd, and his adult children Martha was a journalist already at the Chicago Tribune. His son, who studied in Berlin, where I studied, but had a different name then. But what's interesting, as the Dodds left, this is them arriving in Bremen, I think, or Hamburg, as they went from Chicago to New York to get on that ship, which is the arrivals photographed here, some rich New York philant um, entrepreneur or industrialist invited them to his penthouse in Upper, West Side, uh, Upper East Side. And they went and they, he wined and dined them. And then it's in his diary, or his daughter's diary. Afterwards, they pushed back the table, got out the cigars, and talked about Ambassador Dodd's new appointment. He was one of FDR's first appointees. He'd been a professor of history at Chicago. He was about to leave for Nazi Germany. It was March of 33, so the Nazis were right in power. And the industrialists, or whoever this man was, lots of money, the Yankee elite, he said at some point, well, Ambassador, just let Hitler have his way with the Jews, and he'll take care of the Jewish problem. OK? I mean, this sort of thing was from the upper echelons of the power all the way to the bottom uh, echelons of the culture. Reflexive anti-Semitism, um, the Dodds experienced this. Um, I remember when I, I was teaching in New York, our assistant 
head at the Quaker school I was teaching told the story that in the 30s his parents married and were in their little hotmobile driving from Brooklyn or Queens down to Miami for their honeymoon. And when they pulled up this Art Deco, beautifully painted um, hotel in, West, uh, in Miami Beach to go register, there was a sign, no dogs or Jews allowed. Was Ambassador Dodd the, the uh, gentleman whose daughter uh, socialized with uh, Nazi soldiers? And had a date with, uh, had a date with Hitler. His Hassenfengel um, was trying to match the Hitler with, yes, yeah. She's a character, yeah. And she later married a New York Jewish guy, Howard Stern. I may be slaughtered his name. Yeah, and, and, and they're the ones that then ran to Mexico out of the reach of the FBI or the CIA. Then they ended up, they defected and, and moved to the Soviet bloc and she died just before I lived in Czechoslovakia after the wall fell. So, an interesting character in all of her own right. Yes. But the reason I'm bringing up these different biographies is to talk about there was this pervasive anti-Semitism that was throughout the culture. So these 105, 185 refugees arrived in, in New York and a few arrived through Baltimore. They arrived in a country that had everywhere anti-Semitism was all, parlor, uh, it's in, in German, one second Steve, salon fake, it's, it's um, acceptable publicly acceptable. It, no one hardly batted an eye, except for probably Jews. So how did the Van Fels fit in? Were they... They sang at the hostel. So they were not anti-Semitic? That I don't know. I wasn't trying to make that point. Maybe they were. I, I don't know. I'm trying to separate them out from ambassador. They, they just happened to appear as I was trying to give you folks a thumbnail sketch of this great resource that you can look at home so I don't they're, have to beat the drum here. Ambassador. No, I don't know. They were the Austrian upper class, and they were apparently Catholic. I mean, I don't know, but it's not our uh, business they, tonight. Didn't they become refugees themselves? They were refugees. They're the ones, according to the film, they walked over the mountain at night. Actually, it was a little bit different, but they, they, they left on purpose. They were refugees. That's a very valid point. They, too, were refugees, but they had a different, I mean, they opened their own lodge and, and went singing, so they had their own, if you will, um, way to support themselves. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, they just kind of would be singing in Iowa City, and somebody said you should go sing up a scattergood, and so they went and sang up a scattergood. It was a totally separate dream. Sorry. <laughs> I, I've lost half an hour of technical snafu, so I'm trying to uh, dash forward. So this is the context. One, two more things I want to cite before I talk about scattergood as such. There's a book called Paper Walls, and I forget the Wyman is maybe the author, who has documented that the State Department, for its part had a policy of accidentally losing your application to emigrate. Oh, sorry, we've lost your application as refugee status. Start again. Do you know how hard it was? The Nazis used every trick to milk the Jews of their money because they had to ping pong around the um, Reich to get their insurance paper stamped in Stuttgart, to have a, a taxes paid stamp in Hamburg. I mean, these people were sent packing those who want to legally emigrate and not escape through, like the uh, Krautheimers did through the swamps between Belgium and uh, Germany or over the Alps like others. Those who legitimately wanted to legally emigrate, the longer you were there, the less you got to take with you and the Nazis were very good at taking from you everything they could. So when the State Department lackeys said, oh, we've lost your application, start again, can you imagine what that meant for these people? They didn't have photocopiers. I mean, in the 60s in Clear Lake, we barely had mimeograph machines or carbon paper. So these poor people were sent packing once again across the Third Reich to get the paper signed again and stamped. And the Germans loved stamps. So these people, it was horrible to pull this cynical trick on them. The State Department drug feet and lost applications to put the people to the back of the line. And this is something no one today who's alive in the State Department is there to, to, um, to whip. But do we do this for Muslims today? Do we actually lose their application? Sorry, you can't come. We've lost your application. Go back to Baghdad or go back to Damascus or whatever. Sorry. Do we do this trick today? It's plausible. There was just an article about it. Of course they're doing the trick today. I think it was just today or yesterday that they're delaying applications and slowing the process down. And we have the fewest immigrants coming into the country right now as we have Ever. in decades because they're dragging their feet on everybody. That's, that's 
from his doctor not to start an argument. Will you be sad when I take him on the road? You're totally right. You're doing it today exactly the same way. I'm taking him on the road with me. He's good. I'm, he's, <laughs> I have a trunk. We can bring your stuff in the trunk. Um, and the second thing I want to say before we get to Scattergood per se, so you know the State Department is dragging its heels. It's trying to make it difficult for any Jew, but um, for German Jews to come into the country. If you're Marlene Dietrich, or if you're a Jew of some standing, Albert Einstein, or if you're um, from Lüneburg, Lübeck, the uh, Mann, which Mann fled. Anyway, if you're a celebrity, it's easier, and they don't lose your papers. But if you're run-of-the-mill you know, Jewish butcher from Neustadt or you're someone else, good luck. The last thing before Scattergood, I need to talk about the US Jews' ambivalence about bringing Jews from Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, I talked with some of my friends about this. A lot of these early American Jews were German Jews. The Slavic Jews came later, the 1890s, 1907 onward. So the German Jews living here since Civil War or before, they were hesitant. They weren't so thrilled to have all the Russian Jews come at the turn of the century. Okay? Just like African Americans in Chicago who'd been there for a couple generations weren't so thrilled in the teens when all these African Americans from the Delta states began drifting up for jobs in World War I. And they had brochures, I've seen them, how to behave yourself in public in the streetcars. Because the integrated African Americans in Chicago didn't want backlash from the recently immigrated Southerners. Same thing with the German Jews here. They didn't want newcomers to come and rock the boat and stir up anti-Semitic anti -Semitic resentment for, towards everybody. So that's the stage I wanted to set. Anti-Semitism, even within the Jewish community, divisions and reticence to really help those in Europe trying to get out. Let's talk about Scattergood. When I was thinking about what to tell you folks, this is the first time I've done this of the eight programs that are scheduled. Um, I was really searching my heart. I, I wrote about this film the stories we choose to tell are the stories we want to believe. So this film you saw is a great story, and it's all true. There's nothing that's not true, but it's only part of the story. And part of the blame for this version of the story lays here, because I gave them most of the information they had to work with from my interviews, from the documents, from my own values. But now I'm 20 years down the road or more, and I see that I need to tell the other part of the story so that when I'm done telling the story at all, both sides are there. So here's the other side. I wasn't ready to tell this story in the 90s, and the audiences also weren't ready to hear it, but now we're all different people. That train left the station, and we're further along. Um, in the early days, the AFSC, I've seen the memos, they were in my hand, they're in the archives, wrote to the Iowa Quakers, oh, how good that you're inviting Rabbi Monheimer from Des Moines to come. He was a very venerable, well-seen Midwest rabbi of some influence. It's good that you're working with the Iowa City Jews, the Bravermans, um, the Cedar Rapids Jews. That's all very good. But don't come off as too close to the Jews. Don't come off as seen as coddling the Jews. And that's, as I remember it, that's verbatim. Don't come off as seen coddling the Jews. So here you've got these Quaker farmers trying to rescue Jews, but don't get too close. Don't coddle them. Why? It's political considerations, isn't it? I've just painted in broad strokes the anti-Semitism that was everywhere. OK? One of the reasons I plausibly came to the conclusion I wanted to um, document that you know the blind Quakers didn't honor the cultural origins of these refugees there are pictures, which I may be able to find here. Um, Rescues of Jews. This is actually a German, a German Jewish immigrant from the 1890s who saved 125 relatives and friends from Frankfurt. Scattergood and its sister organization in Richmond, Indiana, Quaker Hill. If you go to Quaker Hill, it's still there. It's a program Quaker uh, retreat center called Quaker Hill. Oh, look. There's, an, there's a, 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 an accompanying photo of Scattergood at the Christmas tree. So they were having Christmas celebrations with all these Jewish guests. You could argue it was for the staff, but it wasn't. All the photos of the Scattergood tree, and they're over in Tipton on the wall, you can see them. 
They were surrounded by Jewish children with Christmas presents, and they were probably thrilled to have presents. One thing I could say, we have to relativize this. I told you con context is key. Most German Jews were quite assimilated, as were Dutch Jews, French Jews. East of Berlin, though, less and less, right? And many German Jews actually did enjoy the Christmas um, season. Yeah? And I asked some of them, well, what about these pictures of Christmas at Scattergood with little Jewish children opening presents? And they said, actually, we were thrilled to have that for the children. Yeah? It reminded us of Christmas at home. I suppose it's sort of like my five um, Jordanian interns, two were Christian, three were Muslim, who said that they like, the, the Muslim boys said they like Christmas in Amman because everyone gets lots of good sweets and um, you know, the liquor flows a bit better. So it's all relative, isn't it? But this is why I came to the conclusion, oh, what's this? Christmas trees at Scattergood. Also what's true is that there were, was little Jewish practice at Scattergood. The Lichtensteins, Edith was this morning. Anyone hear the Iowa Public Radio interview with Edith Lichtenstein this morning? Anyway, you could call it up online probably. Um, they came to Cedar Rapids to, to celebrate the high holidays here with Cedar Rapids Jews. And some of the Cedar Rapids Jews probably helped get the jobs for some of them at Smulikoff's at the department store or furniture store, which I think is now closed. And, and Ginsburg's, that the Ginsburg jewelry also placed some of these refugees, okay? Um, one couple, Melanie and Jakob Winkler, were very hard to place. They were sent to Hillel in Iowa City for a while, sort of, let's put, and they were older Jews, and I don't think spoke English very well, because English was not yet the world language, it was still French. They pushed them off to Hillel. Hillel sent them back to Scattered at one point. I think the Winklers were there three times. The last place we know of, they were sent to Sioux City, and then that landed in the Jewish community there, which was quite large and quite strong. Abigail Van Buren and Ann Landers came out of that same community. Um, the staff. I have had the documents in my hand. I don't know what they mean. We don't have all the corresponding documents. But one time, a young Chicago Jewess, I assume that Rachel Weiss was a Jew, she came from Chicago for a long weekend to be at the hostel and to apply for a job. She was 20, 25. She wanted to be on staff, and she was rejected. And I have Martha, or I had, Martha Balderson, the director's letter to the FSC in Philadelphia. It pained me greatly, but in the end, I had to make the decision based on race. They didn't hire based on race. Can someone tell me what, that, what does that mean, based on race? Yeah, it's, it's not good, and it's a problem. How can you be, quote, saving Jews, and yet don't coddle them and don't put them on your staff? This is a problem. As a non-Jew, I'm bothered by this, okay? And again, like I told you when I gave the context in the Midwest, we have to talk about the context among Jews at Scattergood. We know from the documents, the Viennese Jews didn't care for what they called the Prussian Jews, the Berlin Jews, and the Berliner Jews didn't care for the Viennese Jews. And both sets of Germanic Jews disdained the Russian and Polish Jews. So you had a pecking order in the hostel. You literally had the Viennese and Berlin Jews vying for favor, and then you had the Polish and the Russian Jews. So somewhere there's a breakdown of solidarity when you've got a hierarchy, who's the better Jew, who's the lesser Jew. I will point out that to my best guess, because we don't have the records, the Quakers didn't mark people as Jewish or not Jewish, I'd say about 85% of the 185 guests were Jewish or of non-Aryan ancestry. Some of them we know, Kurt Schaefer, the Berlin mathematician, um, later a professor of math at U of I, they informed him he was a Jew. He didn't know he was Jewish. Under Nazi racial laws, he wasn't a full Aryan. He had to leave for political reasons as well. But I'd say about 85% of the people were Jewish or non-Aryan. A lot of them were mixed marriages, like the Krauthammers, you saw um, Gunter Krauthammer in the film. His mother was a German Lutheran from Saxony. His father was a Polish Jew. The um, Seligmans were the same. 
and you also had um, another couple, the Lichtensteins. Edith Lichtenstein Morgan's mother had been a Lutheran who converted to Judaism. Her father was a German liberal Jewish lawyer, uh, judge later. So even among the Jews, you had this split background. Okay, we're almost to the point of questions and answers. Um, I have one more story I want to leave you with, and this is why I gave you the self-deprecating story at the beginning. All these are very sensitive issues. All these issues around identity and who is what and how do you refer to people and honor who they say they are. You know that video clip? I'm probably gonna regret saying this. Remember that video clip of the exhibit over near Des Moines of the hostel? We were collaborating with a Jewish Midwest Historical Society. I said A, I didn't say the, with a Midwest-based historical society. And in the morning, the exhibit was supposed to open. I got a very angry phone call that people on their committee had read the exhibit guide, which was basically all the panel text in a book. And they said, you have to change the book. I said, I can't. What's the problem? The Shostals, he was a Viennese Jew. She, his wife, Magdalena, was a Hungarian Catholic. They went to the Iowa City Wagner concert, and they were taken with other refugees, and they had lamb and mint sauce. I said, yeah, but you can't, you can't, you can't. Wagner was anti-Semitic. I said, yes, but they went. To, so what's interesting was I got flack. This wouldn't, be con this wouldn't be acceptable by some of these people's sponsors, some of whom were more conservative or orthodox. So me being clueless, didn't know why, what's the problem? I asked Steve about lamb, and lamb is okay to eat, I guess. Maybe it's the mint sauce, I don't know. But what I got was, you have to take it out of the exhibit guide, and I said, even if I could, I wouldn't. And there was a huge bite. I said, for historical integrity, as a historian, if they went to the Wagner opera, then by God, they went to the Wagner opera. But this is our problem. Which story do we remember? And we tell the stories we want to believe. So you saw the happy Whip Oprah Winfrey story. It was love and peace. And you have me coming now 25 years saying, 25 years later saying, yes, it's all true. And don't coddle the Jews. Don't have one in your staff. But then we have Jews saying, Eastern European Jews, and we've got modern Jews saying, you can't put in the exhibit guide, they went to Wagner. So I leave you at the question answer period for you to come up, what's the sense of all this? What do we make of all this? Because I don't know. Thank you. Louder. I'll start, and I hope other people ask questions. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Oscar Schindler before, who was, as a human being, a lousy person. Yeah. And the same contradiction of his, he was a terrible person, except he saved over a thousand Jews. In fact, I've tried to figure out ever since I heard the story, why him, a member of the Nazi party, a guy who cheated on his wife repeatedly. <coughs> After the war, he failed in business during the war. We know why. After the war, he failed in business again. He went bankrupt. Jews helped him after the war. He cheated again on his wife. He got divorced again. Why would such a guy, beautifully uh, filmed by uh, Spielberg. Uh, Spielberg, why would this guy, who was a terrible personal human being, do what he did? It's the same thing here. I mean, humans have various sides. Yeah. And, uh, I can admire what Oscar Schindler did. I can admire what the uh, uh, Quakers did in um, uh, Scattergood School, but they're complex people, and I'm not at all surprised that they wouldn't hire the, the Jewish person. Well, it surprises so me, and I'm mortified. It's a mortifying act, but I'm not surprised by it. I think anti-Semitism was part of regular life back then, as it is in some, to some degree today. Uh, just a couple of comments and then a question, uh, uh, or maybe they're all observations. First of all, Thomas Friedman, of course, was St. Paul, and there are a whole bunch of very prominent Jews from that, so you're, you're absolutely right. I, I want to make a contemporary um, um, state, uh, statement about our own times vis-a-vis -vis what you said. 
you're talking about immigrants. And if there's one word that ties Pittsburgh, New Zealand, and Charlottesville all together, and the word is replacement. In other words, the immigrants are coming to replace the white race. This is, there's a man by the name of Camus, who, not, not the famous Camus, who has written extensively about this. So for example, in Pittsburgh, why was this particular congregation singled out? Because they were giving money, and here's my question, they were giving money to Hyatt's, Hebrew immigrant aid society. And I, I lived about two blocks from Hyatt's, and by the way, my father was a Russian Jew, my mother was a German Jew. Interesting situation. Anyway, um, so that they're giving money to, you can, you can kind of minimize the word Hebrew in this case, because hmm. now it's immigrants. Um, so, uh, I don't know if I have a question or not, but it, <laughs> I, I, just, I just realized there is this, um, there is this tie-in to immigrants uh, to what's going on now and a similar kind of response. You know, history doesn't repeat itself, it's, it's just kind of uh, mimics itself. So. Uh, Rabbi, do you have the computer? Do I? You started there. Okay, one second. Um, when we uh, disband our Louis to the uh, book, book table, that's how we fund this happy uh, show that I do. This whole issue from the State Historical Society um, news magazine is about the KKK in Iowa. There were tens of thousands of members in Iowa in the 20s. Nationwide, there were almost 3 million KKK members. 600,000 who are women, and one of the centers was in Indiana. And you know the surprising part, I mean the KKK as a group in the 20s, they weren't friends of Jews either, but they weren't particularly anti-black to the extent that you would imagine. Do you know what the KKK was all about in the 20s? The Catholics. Do you know why? Whitey out on the prairie, like my great-grandfather, who's here, if you want to learn about the Klan, you can get volume one or so of this book. That's the man I'm named for, holding the, my grandfather's a baby. Do you know what the KKK in Iowa was all hopped up about? The Catholics, do you know why? And I come back to your question indeed with immigrants replacement. Long story, very short. World War I, why do you like me, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, goes to fight the Kaiser. I'm over there. There's a labor shortage. They go to the Delta states, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi. They bring African-American workers up to Chicago to the um, packing plants of Waterloo, Ottumwa, Omaha. They bring Italians from Brooklyn to South Des Moines. There's still an Italian village south of Des Moines with great pasta dishes. They bring the um, Serbs and Yugoslavs to Council Bluffs. They bring Irish somewhere else. So the headhunters bring the labor replacement to Iowa. And except for the um, Delta State African-Americans, the exception of them be the, the Louisiana ones, they're all Baptists, the rest were all Catholic, the Irish, the Poles, the Italians. So white boy comes back from the war and says, you're in my job. I'm not a Marxist, but Karl Marx was probably correct that almost all political struggles begin with an economic spark. It's, it's competition. It's competition. And one more comment. Um, again, you could get my award-winning Midwest Social History tr Trilogy. My family's just a, a page holder for your family. But the race riots of Chicago in 1919, horrible. Uh, African-American boy drifted to the white beach in Chicago and Lake Michigan, and a riot ensued that for days people rioted. White teen and teenagers and men went and hunting through the back streets of South Chicago. There were fires burning. Omaha had the similar experience with Will Brown. It's in the book. Um, Duluth lynched three black circus workers in 1920 because a girl said she'd been raped, even though her doctor couldn't substantiate that. At any rate, what was the problem? The war. African Americans had gone to Europe, and they saw that it doesn't have to be like this. It's not all Jim Crow everywhere. In France, they weren't treated to the humiliation going to the back of the train. They weren't put to the balcony of the cinema. They, the African Americans in France were treated with respect. In fact, in many circles, they were actually um, sought after um, visitors, all right? So they came back here, 
and they were supposed to go back into that role. In fact, one of the things that really upset the racists in this country, and, and they lynched many men, who dared wear their World War I um, soldier uniforms. Because, and there's a famous picture of the Chicago riots, which I think is in my book, it literally put the African-American veterans at the same level as the militia guys, both in uniforms. It's hard to push someone around who's wearing a uniform that you're wearing. So economic competition, the new people come, they should keep going. One footnote that will interest you, there's a rabbi Wechsler, a Bavarian Jew, um, a, a rabbi up in St. Paul in the 1880s, 90s. When the Russian Jews came on the trains from Chicago, he'd meet them at the station and give them money and say, go up to the Dakotas. There are great opportunities for you there. <laughs> and in reality, and it's in, this, it's in one of our books, I think it's book two, the first kibitzum, if that's the plural of kibitz, kibitzum, they were in North Dakota, folks. They were in Israel, 1890s, Devil's Lake, North Dakota. The wife of our board member, Leighton Siegel, Diane Siegel, I don't remember her maiden name, she came from that colony. There were Jewish communal settlements on the plains. Rabbi Vexler would give them money and say, get back on the train and go up to Dakota. There's lots of space. Don't stay in St. Paul. Other questions, comments? Um, I learned a lot of things in the past which really were kind of depressing, but uh, a lot of the Jews and other ethnic people that came to the United States changed their names, even changed their religions. I have actually physically met people that say my grandparents were Jewish, and I met one saying that we lighted candles on Friday night, we never knew why. Huh. And what I'm saying is, do you feel that this was the norm because they had to fit in? One of the things that um, I hope you'll do after this is go to our website, and if I can get this thing to go backwards, you can actually download our YouTube tapings of me at Central College in Pella, but I talk about anti-German hysteria in World War I. One of the reasons we have almost no live German-American culture today is two world wars. When German-Americans anglicize their names, like Chrysler is from K-R-E-I-S-L-E-R. -E it means one who lives in a circle. It's not C-H-R, the car maker. It's Coors Beer. C-O-O-R-S is really K-O-H-R-S. So they anglified their names. They were ashamed. Um, I can't seem to get back to, ah, here we are. So if you go here to historical case studies and you click, the Kaiser is anti-German hysteria. The killer is the flu epidemic that ravaged Cedar Rapids in 1918, 1919. I talk about it. The Klan, 1920s, including the Iowa Klan, the Cow War. Go and pick and, and choose what, what interests you, but this question of integration. The Germans went under cover. Today, if you take Hispanic Americans and divide them by Mexican, Guatemalan, Cuban, etc., the largest ethnic group in the country is still German Americans. Every fifth American has German ancestry. In Iowa, it's two out of five, and in places like Dyersville or other pockets, it's three out of five. So between 40 and 60% of all Iowans have German ancestry, but you'd never know it. Because in World War I, as an example, the majority, the biggest ethnic group, was treated like a minority. People were tarred and feathered, um, the pastor of the church at Berlin, Iowa, now called Lincoln, Iowa, because they changed the name, was taken out of church while preaching in, in German, sent up and down the street, carrying a cross, singing, made a sing uh, patriotic hymns. Germania, Iowa is now Lakota, Iowa by Algona. The governor, Iowa, this is, this is not me with fake news. Again, when these are gone, they're all sold out, so don't hold back. It's in here, after the Squawky Indian photo album, the governor of Iowa forbade the speaking of any foreign language in Iowa during World War I. It was aimed at German. But you had Swedish pastors, the letters are in here, write to say, how shall I give communion? Our older congregates don't speak English. I don't know what the Catholics did with Latin or what the Jews did with Hebrew, but the governor forbade the speaking of foreign languages. No one asked the Muskwakis what they thought of English. So there's this huge pressure that even the biggest minority Americanize. A lot of this goes back to World War I, the extreme pressure. If you were your thing, Hungarian-American, German-American, etc., you were anti-loyal. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, I'll ask another one.
Maybe the, the last one, I think. You're at Cornell at the moment. Yes. So have you been uh, investigating the saga of Eric Coma? I haven't. I don't know it. We'll talk later. If there are no other questions, I encourage you folks um, to go to our website. These things um, are very interesting stuff. It's your history. The last come on I would say as I sent you out the door, who knew that there were all these clan members in Iowa in the 20s? I did. Who knew that Anne Frank had a pen pal in Iowa before she went to hiding in Amsterdam with her family? I did. It's on our website. They just visited an Anne Frank site. In ah. Can you tell us your website again? Trace There's Anne Frank's Iowa pen pal, honest to God, before she went to hiding. Anne Frank wrote letters to Juanita Wagner of Danville by Burlington. And her older sister, Mary Betty Ann, whom I phoned, she was then living in California, she wrote to Anne Frank's sister, Margot. So both Frank's sisters were writing. I keep on touching that board, that damn board. Um, they were writing to the Frank sisters and then the letters stopped, okay? Who knew that the most American POWs in Nazi German camps per capita came from Iowa? Steve Feller and I did. That's why we have this little booklet, including the experience of Jewish American Midwest POWs in Nazi Germany. They weren't taken aside and systematically killed. At the wards end, a few of them were sent to special work camps at Baraka, uh, Barga, this underground missile uh, site. Some of them survived, but they were not taken aside and shot in the head. And also you can learn about the Meskwaki code talkers who were P uh, POWs in Nazi Germany. So I'm hoping you'll come here and learn these stories you can't get elsewhere. The Scattergood book, um, it's the last copies I have. It's uh, going to crack. I know the binding will crack. I can't help it. It's new but old. Come and have a cookie, buy a book, ask Steve Feller to answer other questions. I'm also around. Thanks a lot.